yes, the Archivus. <laughs> Yeah. And we are Very catching good. up with Shock G, the legendary interview that we were supposed to do. The one that put the broccoli in a pasta. Bet you never knew that I'm a roster. Hi, Celestia, Rasta Farah. And who is the legendary Shock G, the chameleon full of infamous neon color? Wow. What'd you call it? Infamous what color? Neon color. Neon. Thank you. That's a glowing, I like fluorescent, neon, and what's that other one? Electric. You put the word electric before color? That's electric green. Woo! Numb from the loonies? He had a candy apple green SS up on like, it was seven G's and rims. We used to think you, you did it, you overdid it. But when he pulled on the block, everybody had to pull over and park and salute him. Who is the legendary Shock G? Greg Jacobs. Who am I? Um, I'm a person who was always doing music with or for someone or I was always like a piano player for someone in a school show or playing drums in a couple bands. When I was 11, I played the bass. But People say, how long have you been doing it professionally? Or how long have you been? And I feel like I can't remember a time when we weren't getting $50 to play at our auntie's party. And then we got a little older. I was getting 200 to play so-and-so's wedding. I like what y'all was doing when I was over your house. That was cool. Can you come over and play my barbecue Sunday? We was like, is, is, uh, is 100 cool? Oh, yeah, baby, of course, you gotta pay the musicians. We were like, yo, that's dope, nigga, that's $20 each. Woo! It's big money to a 12 year old in 1981 or whatever it was. Let's go back before DU from 1978 at Greco Junior High School, getting the most talented award and then backpacking around the USA. It's all about being young and discovering the country. Wow, thank you, brother. I don't know, I didn't take it seriously. I just was like, oh, that's nice. But I had missed, I always missed the uh, yearbook photos at most schools I went to because I just couldn't get on top of that kind of shit. He'd be in basketball in the gym all day sometimes, so especially during that. Like, where are they going? I don't know, man. They're trying to take some pictures and shit. All right, four and four. What are we playing for? Losers got to hump the pole. Oh, man, that's crazy. How many times? Uh, shit like that. You don't do it in front of girls' PE, you get an ass whooping. You get a beat down. You in? All right, bet. Nigga, let's do it. Let's do it. Do shit like that. And then the next day, you see somebody going like this to a pole in front of the whole class. Like, you had to do it. If you didn't do it, you got a beat down. That was that. So I was never really a popular kid either, and I never made any of that yearbook stuff. So when I got that most talented trophy, I was just like, ah, that's dope. I'm going to give that to my mother. Just kept just doing my thing, you know. But uh, it was to me, it was like I made it into something. I was never in the in the books there, man. My mother says I used to walk in the room and start singing Stevie Wonder to the adults. Uptight, everything is all right, out of sight. And they're like, Ah, Gregory, come here, sing for your grandmother. I just run in, do it, uptight, then run back out. I was three years old, so. I was just, it made people smile. That's what I still fish for when I do it, you know. You wanna hear something gross? You like gross shit? The adult version of Hump the Pole was probably the Batman shirt. We ever tell you about that? You were wearing one tonight. You don't know about the Batman shirt? The Batman shirt on the Public Enemy, Big Daddy Kane, Heavy D, MC Light, Third, third Base, a lot of groups and a lot of staff, a lot of bodyguards and drivers and brothers and friends and artists. And so there's a, it's like at least 70 of us 
from city to city, you know. The Batman shirt was whoever got caught with the ugliest girl leaving their room in the morning had to wear the Batman shirt. Scoob or Scrap, one of uh, Kane's dancers, had danced in it or something, and it didn't get washed yet, so it was stinky. So then, then the next person had to wear it again. Now, when someone tried to not wear it, now it's getting stinky. You had to do your, your sound check, go check in at the hotel, anytime you see it in public, and the show, and to the after party if you go, and back to the hotel, you have to do your, spend your whole day in a Batman shirt. After it got three or four people, and they spent the whole day, their show in it, it was rancid. And then, whoever tried to not wear it, you got a beat down from everybody who did wear it. Because what you mean you're not wearing it? I wore that motherfucker with two heads. I had to wear it all, you know what I'm saying? So, that Batman shirt was, and it never got washed. I never had to wear it, I got lucky. You know, everybody was doing their dizzle. But the cats was trying to sneak them out through the hallways and, you know, if, if it was like that, if you even thought she could qualify. You're like, oh, yeah. don't leave yet. Wait till we, our bus is leaving, then you leave. There's cats trying to get away with stuff. But uh, the reason I wouldn't wear it, one time everybody put one on me. Oh, it's her. But my roommate, that was his girl, not mine. I said, I didn't touch her. Come on, I was with 007, you know it, you know it. I used to date Queen Latifah's dance at 007. We had a great time. Ah, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> hey, sweetheart. Long time, man. Miss you in the Bronx. Can you imagine that, though? It's two months tour. A lot of cats is wearing that. You're not allowed to wash it. After a while, you just become it. You sweat with, oh, get out of here. Get out of here, nah. Nobody would let you walk up. It ruins your tour to wear that shirt. Wow. And <laughs> Gregory Rocker and the Master Blasters and the Chill Factor and the original Four Horsemen. Let's hear all about it for real. It's Shaw G. Wow. The first band I was ever in, we called the Norwood Specials. I just, my name was Greg. I was too young to, you know, 11 or 12, I think. Then, I was 13. By then, I started noticing hip-hop. And I wanted to be still P-Funk. So it's so embarrassing. But my first MC name was MC Star Child. <laughs> Sometimes I was Sweet Star Child. Sweet Star Child. <laughs> You know, start child, long hair sucker, partying on the mothership. But yeah, so I'll keep on top. But then my cousin Shaw, now I'm a record passer in the Beach 47th Street crew. We just say, because we didn't have a name, but we do parties in parks and basements. And I moved to Tampa by the time this started up. So I could only do it with him the whole two weeks that I'm there for Christmas with all three months I'm there for summer but it was enough and Shari said what you call yourself MC Sweet Star Child he was like nah that's whack he said look your name's Greg you should be Shah G because he was Shah T he later became No Face but they wasn't singers they was rhymers at first I'm talking about 76 77 78 so I wrote my rhymes to Shah G by accident I like that prefix in the Bronx, everybody was Grandmaster something. Brooklyn, MC something. Queens, there was a lot of Shaw somebody. Shaw Vaughan, King whoever. He was like, no, I, I meant you're Greg. You should be King G. Shaw G. Science. No, everybody's. Nation of Islam. Everybody's using Arabic. Five percenters. That's right. They was out at the same time that the Red Berets was out to make the subway safe. And the Four Horsemen? Well, let me work my way up to that. After leaving New York at Shock G now, now I get down to Tampa and we can't even think about going back to instruments anymore. It's like, yo, this is mind blowing what's going on in New York. Instantly, everybody involved, the audience and the people rhyming, even by 78, already knew 
that we were witnessing something that was as heavy as jazz or any music that's ever been. Like this is a subculture. It was just amazing when there's no rap records out. Still eight dollar tickets sometimes to see the biggest cats. It was just crazy. So yeah, as soon as I got back to Tampa, we put together Master Blasters. We switched it all up. And every time we did a party, we sucked in more people. Every time we did a party, we attracted more MCs. And y'all, they were just standing there by the turn. He was like, yo, I was driving by. That's how we met DJ Flame. He was like, I was down here visiting my aunt. And I'm driving home. You know the shit they played out here, God, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Somebody's cutting Apache. I almost crashed. It sounded like the Bronx right over there. And come up here and it was y'all, man. DJ Flame, man, New York, Bronx. Yo, Shock G, Queens and Brooklyn. Yeah, 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 you, everybody, you know. Kenny K was from Florida, he's the only one. He was four horsemen. But Master Blasters, we were all from New York. K-Bar, same thing. Our families moved out here for jobs. And love the South, I love the South, but I never was completely fit, fit in or accepted by everybody. There's a lot of cats that, yeah, but then there was cats that's like, why you talk proper? So much so, we was, we were tearing up Tampa. Riverfront Park gatherings, thousands of people just do it. It's just like festival at the lake in Oakland, a car show, where the shit that happens every weekend in your city and it's a gathering. That was the thing we used to blow up every Sunday, Riverfront Park. I was blowing that up one time. And then I wasn't even rhyming, I was just DJ. K Bar rhymed, Flame went around sometimes. Kent, my little brother, would rhyme. Kent's Humpty in the uh, Dan Aykroyd movie. Till I spin around, I have to talk. But it's him and he's Shock G when I'm not. What up, Kent? Love you, man. What's up, Zazu? That's my new nephew, Kent's son. Woo! That kid's a genius, man. But um, on turntables, I was one of the few DJs, or the only one that I knew of, but I felt that there had to be more of them out. But I was the only DJ that I knew of that could do the adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel with the records. Not with his record. I used to pile them up on a platter. And you had to get to it quick. And sometimes I add a scratch to it, or two. Because it usually it took every second just to get it. Good time, just do 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 I don't even remember the routine, but I had all the, went got all the originals. I used to do that to show people my DJ. And everybody in the clique was real proud of that. Ronnie Ron was another MC. He's from Newark, New Jersey. The MD Dazzling Doc P came later. Well, he was from the Bronx, too. We just had like a little southern clip of New Yorkers that, because we felt like it's like, back then it was culture shock. It's just, if you move to Cali right now, people, when you see a Canadian, you're going to be like, oh, you forgot? Yeah, what's up? Y'all just going to powwow. Yeah. But we had a few cats from Tampa in the clip, too. Kenny K. Um, Kush was from New York, but he had been in Tampa since. 69 or something. So he considered himself Florida. He didn't, he just blends records. He doesn't rhyme. But he was a singer when we was Parliament 2. Parliament 2, after we would have know with specials, then Parliament 2 was what we called ourselves at the Greco Junior High days. And that was just, to me, that's the laziest name in the world. <laughs> but we loved them so much. It was just like somebody having a group called We the Tupacs. We knew, mostly that's all we played, except Strawberry Letter 23 we played once, but everything else we played, P-Funk only. We love all the music out there, funk-wise. But we wasn't trying to play none of those records, only P-Funk. Because... I would have fell asleep playing doom 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 Now if you loop that and wrote it, that's dope. But if you stand in there playing bass through the whole song, and that's all you can make it do? 
Meanwhile, Funkadelic Delic Day was all soloing at once. The singers, everybody. She was bananas. That's why we kept bringing it around different every time. That's why I was used to variety. There's spots in a Humpty Dance where it only do that there. That was the only time we broke it down like that. Oh, this is, all those were on the fly, too, different. That sample, I don't think I played that the same way through the whole song. The bass line, yeah, we needed something to be consistent. But, yeah, we put the variety in other ways. It's nice. Right, right, sorry, sorry. I'm reminiscing. These are great, great That's great, great memories. That's, that's how we do it. So, this was around 80 or 81 that Master Blasters we put together. And we stopped trying to play instruments. And I sold my drums. At Riverfront Park, the program director to WTMP, the hot station at the time there, the urban station, walked up to me, man, you guys are dope. How, how was you wanna, ever thought about an on-air gig? So also as Rackadelic, I was supposedly the youngest on-air DJ in Tampa with a, in mid-central Florida with a regular time slot. I had a regular time slot. I used to say, they call me Rackadelic. Dun, 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 and I'd play whatever record I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. Another one was, what did I play behind that? They call me Rackadelic. <clears throat> Whatever the, my favorite record that was out, I would say for that trial. Because I was from New York. And Frankie Crocker and WBLS, those DJs were creative about how they do shit. Chuck Lennon on BLS, he used to use the <laughs> Voices, that police record. He used to, when it went to Chuck Leonard, Chuck Leonard, Chuck Leonard, Chuck Leonard, he'd always say it until they finished that part. We was like, Chuck Leonard is hard. He hard for that. He was a hip hop DJ. Frankie Crocker was another one on BLS. His, his, start, his show used to start, Frankie, it's him, my idol. You hear a girl say, Crocker. He used to sign off every night after his four hours with, there I go, there I go, there. That's it, New York. That's it, got to split. He said, well, the time is, time is near for me to get the hell on out of here. Get my ass to the ribs. He says, Harlem, uh, uh, good night, New York. Good morning, Harlem. There I go, there I go, there. He used to sign off like that. And he used to always say, Good night, New York. Good morning, Harlem, when he got up there, because Harlem been up all night. <laughs> he was funny like that, you know? So, and I, I guess Luda, Sly Stone, they're probably the same way when they were DJs. But yeah, Big Boy in LA. He's one of them DJs, you see posters of him around LA with girls and the parties he throws. He's known. His persona is as important part of the program as all the records he plays, you know. But anyway. And then the Four Horsemen? Got fired for that shit. Master Blasters ended when... Somebody went to college. And I dropped out of school and left town. My father and I was getting clash, clash, clash to the point where... Yeah, something had to happen. He was like, look, well, you, you want to go in Job Corps or the military? But I'm taking you out of school. I don't want you in a constant failing atmosphere. And I see you not messing with that. So I'm taking you out of school. My unexcused absences made me get F sometimes. Not from not passing the test. My teachers say, it's a shame. No, he's a smart kid. It's a shame. That's the policy, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> Seven unexcused absences. So one of them times when I had to go see the dean, my dad showed up to get me. He was like, I'm taking you out of school. 
had to get away from my father. Pops, I love you. But I had to get out that house. Because we was grown ass men in the same house. I'm not grown, but I know what I'm talking about when it comes to music and art. And he knows what he's talking about when it came to the things he did, which was computers and format and things. And, you know, I learned a lot of stuff from my dad as far as doing a job right. And he believes in hard, hard work. And it has to be hard work. He's not a delegator. I used to get ass whoopings for shit like this. The lawn's mowed, everything's fine. My dad just happens to overhear one day from kids talking and somehow he figured out that I had paid one of the kids down the street to do it so I could go DJ this party or something. Storm right to my bathroom. Gregory, did you, did you get somebody to pay to mow your lawn on your time? I was like, yeah, what's wrong with that? I had something to do. That's the allowance I give you. <laughs> I was only like, I was a young kid. He was just like, Who cares what I do with it? It was only six bucks or something. The kid was eager. He was happy. He made the money. That kid is not going to put the care into our yard that you're supposed to. I said, that's not true. You just want me to do it because you know I don't like to do it. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> Yo, he used to be at you. Which, you know, I got one where I say, they call me Shachi, nigga, it's Pen. Ben. My dad was real cold to me, had to take that with Ben. Then he started putting his fists, and then I started trip, Ben. Didn't let go with me, since then I've been lit, Ben. My life, real nice, such and such and such, palm trees, New York. Lights. Went out to Cali and found my wife. Money being two pockets, a hell of a crew. And thanks to y'all, I got to do DU. And who is this? This is a dude from Salt Lake. I hope that comes out. That's what the strings do. So I just had to come with that. Had to take that with. And my mom was psycho too. Gregory, go in the room. Take your pants off. Bring your belt back out here when you're finished. Go! You know them shits where you got to get an ass whooping? My father was like that, too. He's cooking. So, Gregory. Huh? Hmm. This needs a little pasta. A little such and such. So, what did I ask you to do this morning? Huh? Gregory, what did I ask you to do this morning? Go to the store and get what? Dog food and milk. And, and where did you go? I wound up going over Kush house. Because we, we got something to do and we needed to figure it out. And I forgot. Hmm, you forgot. Okay, he's not even looking at me. This is like Papa Dearest. Well, you're going to go clean your room. And then the fact that he's cooking and not looking at me, oh, I'm looking at him like this. I'm sitting at the table. And when you finish cleaning your room, take off all your clothes and call me. But uh, Gregory! You just have to go to the room. Like, yo, I cleaned that room for like hours. I'm with a toothbrush. It's time to clean. Floorboards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I guess I was about 13 then. You know, it's getting embarrassing. I'm getting too old for this. Sometimes I run by a window. Ah! I'm getting whipped by my mom or my dad. And as I passed the window, ah! trying to protect it, I thought I noticed all oh, the kids who go to my school, my neighbors, oh, I like this. But could I have seen that? No way. Ah, ah. Yup, I find out. That was them at the window. Greg's getting a whooping. Ah, oh, check it out. But uh, some of them were just whoopings. But some of them, my dad started like, only because I was blocking. I'm getting older now. I was about 14 or 15. I'm not letting them hit me. I'm like, come on, come on. Come on, come on. And he couldn't get one in for the first time in his life. 
and he just went <laughs> and punched through everything and broke my eye. Broke this, this, tripod. We didn't know all that. I just had a black eye at school forever. <laughs> so when he did that, I felt my eye going. I fell to the ground, ran through his leg, and then ran, jumped out the window. <laughs> but you can't just jump out the window on my dad. You got to lock the door and then go fuck with the window because he's right there. Boom, boom. Gregory, open this goddamn door. I'm out. I hear the car. I like, oh, he's chasing me. I ran to my friend Gus's house. His mom, he wasn't there. His mom was there. Miss Torres, open the door. My dad's trying to kill me. Open the door. She looked at me all bleeding. She's like, ah, ah. And ran away from the door. Maybe she went to call the police or something. I don't know what she's going to do. But I didn't have time. Because right when she, I love it, it pulled up. So I ran through his backyard. Cut through some backyards, ran up to a 7-Eleven. My dad showed up right as the police were showing up, right as our family attorney showed up. I don't know how that happened. But when the police and the lawyer got there, I'm inside the 7-Eleven running around the cash island. And the dude in the store is like, my dad's chasing me out. God damn it, Gregory, get in the car. Gregory, if you don't get in that fucking car. And I'm like, no, I'm not coming home. I'm never coming home. Run around, sir. Then the police pull up. I don't know who called them or what. And then the police go, all right, stop running around. Back away from here. Back away. Come here, son. Come here, son. Did he do this to you? You want to press charges? I don't know how this happened. But out of nowhere, our family attorney just was a third face in it. I was going... And he was like, okay, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. My dad would walk up. The police was like, sir, you need to back up right now. You need to back up. We're just talking to him. Would you like to press charge? And I'm contemplating. And then your Dell just showed up. Gregory, you do not want to press charge in front. You don't know what you're doing, son. You don't know what you're doing. And he could see it on my face. Look at the cop. Well, I'm not asking you. So I'm an attorney. I have a right to uh, So he couldn't round him away. And when he's talking, I'm looking at him. My dad comes running back up. Gregory, get it. Eddie, if you don't get in that car, I'm going to beat your ass. This is what our lawyer says to my dad. <laughs> that was funny in hindsight. But he walked away. But he said it with that tone like, you about to go to jail if you don't walk away, you know. And he was like, do you want to press charges? And when my father would start talking, Eddie, if you don't shut up, he's still like, Gregory, when we get home, he's still like, the more he talking, the more I'm going to press charges, you know? You don't press charges? No, I don't want to press charges. So, crazy shit like that also happened. I don't want to paint the picture that that was the only way my childhood was. My father and I were best friends. My mother and I, we're best friends too sometimes. It just, that part was hectic. <laughs> that part, and these days, that's illegal now. So both y'all are going to be seeing from, hearing from my lawyers, mom, dad. <laughs> just playing. I deserved it a lot of times too. I never did what I was supposed to do. And so the master blasters dissolved because... Omar had kid had a kid. He got a girl pregnant. Had to move to Miami to take care of her. Oh. Kayvon went to jail for something. Weed. Selling weed. It's week 15 and 16. And he didn't get when he got out, he became a Christian rapper. I think it was part of his parole or some stupid stuff. If he did this, they wouldn't put as much time on or something. And he became a Christian rapper. I was like, not Kayvon. He's <laughs> fly. K Bob was his name. You know, see, his self was like, stealing out on 40 Deuce, my grand, brand new Code of Ville. Code of Ville was these, them long lamb looking coats. 
two niggas, bro. I go, me said, tell me what's the deal. Now, they wanted my money. They wanted my coat. What was I to do? I reached in my inside pocket. I was a pack in a 22. I said, bang, bang, shoot them up. I don't care. I don't give a fuck until the beat beat. Turn it out. That's how K-Bar used to rhyme. So when he became a Christian rapper, we were just like, he didn't even make it out yet. He was like, damn, are you serious? Like, when I, when I could see he was serious, I didn't want to say nothing against it, but, so that went that way. Who else, man? Chris went in the military. And to get away from my father, I got a job. He was like, if you don't get a job by a certain amount of time, you either got to get out or you got to go to the job corps. So I found a way out of the house. I knew if I ran away, my dad would look for me and hire people to find me. So to get out of the house, I got a job with a traveling sales company selling, you know, cleaning products, vacuum cleaners, selling them vacuum. They drive about five of us out to a neighborhood. We all walk. This is your street. All right, Greg. Hold on. We got you up here, Marlon. You know, we all have different areas. So what I used to do, this is bad. <laughs> I used to creep thief. What I would do is, if someone came to the door, this is Coral Gables, Miami. Nice houses. It's like Beverly Hills. If someone came to the door, I would try to sell them a vacuum cleaner. But if nobody answered the door, sometimes I would go around and try to, the garage door, the carport, the back door, big shrubbery separated in trees so neighbors can't really see you. Once you're up in their doorway, you're out of the view of everybody. So I would just try the door sometimes. And you'd be surprised how many people don't lock the door. Only things that could fit in my vacuum bag. So I would always do the same thing. Go straight to the bedroom, look for guns or jewelry or cash. Guns or jewelry. If I didn't see any, then okay. I didn't look at nothing else. You know, I was always hoping somebody didn't shoot me because in Florida you can shoot an intruder legally. But after I was like, hello? Hello? It's me. I got the vacuum cleaner stuff on me, so I'm figuring if I do get caught in someone's house, maybe I could talk my way out of it. Hey! No, I thought someone at this address told me to come back. I got your Kirby ready for you. Here, I'm, I'm Greg Jacobs. And I really was, so. But a lot of times it was a gun or some jewelry. Not that much cash. I didn't find any cash. But jewelry or guns, because I knew I could sell it easy. As soon as I got enough to quit, after one month on the road, I quit. I didn't want to do that. I just did that to do that. Meanwhile, now I'm like joining bands, doing murals for people's bedrooms. Back then it was $200 to put Diana Ross on someone's living room wall. Or people in LA always wanted a Brooklyn Bridge if they were from New York. Or you just step shit like that. Some people wanted his wife. Murals were real popular indoor in houses in the 80s. So, that was one of my hustles. Evolved into stealing cars a little bit. I wasn't really a burglar, but creep thief. It was always really rich homes. And I had an attitude. I was young and felt like I, the world owed me because I was a young black male. So, like, y'all, these fucking rich ass people, they wouldn't love me anyway. You know, should have locked your door. Fuck it. I felt entitled. <laughs> Found a little pool room downtown Miami. Walked right in. Sold them guns right away. Sold all that shit. And now I'm just out. I went and bought a room for two weeks. At just whatever cool little hotel. Nothing extravagant. And then I walked downtown Miami. I walked outside. And I'm 15 years old. And I'm realizing... I'm free in the United States, and my family doesn't know where I'm at, and I'm on my fucking own. I could do whatever I want to do, I'm 15. That feeling, I'll never forget that. It was like, my household was real strict. You know, a lot of things I should have done with my life, I didn't do just because my father was so pushy about it. Mm -hmm. Even making records was sort of like to get it was despite him. Because he was like, you don't want to be a musician. A musician? Musicians who stay in the cheapest hotels. It's nothing but a bunch of drugs. None of them have any money. 
I was like, Rick James makes more in one show than you do all year. He was, you know, a buppy suit and tie and management. He said, Rick James, Rick James, Gregory, Michael Jackson, Rick James, those people you hear on the radio, these are special blessed people. If you had that kind of talent, we'd know by now. Now go clean your room. <laughs> I like, crush my dream and walk away. I was like, no, it's not true. Just because you say it all loud don't mean it's true. My mother knew, knew me better. She said, they're just people, Gregory. They put their shoes on the same way we do. And she would take me to meet artists. And you see them in real life, and they weren't perfect like they are on their album covers. And that's how I knew they were. Maybe Michael Jackson had some seance, him and Pac and Bob Marley. But Rick James and every, most of the people on the radio, just regular cats, you know. What a chance. And who stuck to it. And luck involved. It's, it's not just preparedness. Less than anything is talent. 10,000 hours, they just figured out. When any time someone reaches 10,000 hours of practice, whether you get it in two years, 10 years, whether it's athleticism, music, ballet, bass, whatever. They said, well, at 10,000 hours of practice, pretty, pretty much anyone can be considered a genius on their instrument. That they think. So it's opportunity, I think. A lot of luck involved, too. My mother, she was scared for a different reason. She said, you want to do music? You probably won't make it. Not because you're not good. I think you're great, son. But most people don't make it. 1% of those people you're on the radio, I know musicians who are great, who sing better than so-and-so, all her favorites. And she said, there's just not enough room for everybody. I said, Ma, I don't have to make it. I said, if as long as I have an apartment to live in and a, some kind of car to drive, I don't, I'll be the blues piano player that can blar down the block. I'll be in some top 40 band that does shoot cruise ships. As long as I'm making my money doing it, I'll be happy. She said, really? Then you should be a musician. <laughs> Love you for that, Ma. Before I just run away from saying I was hustling, I want to say something that's very important to me, and I always knew it all along the way. My girlfriend and I eloped to California. Sometimes we needed things that we couldn't afford. We would rent things and then steal them. We said, you need a new keyboard, baby. You need a new... And we would rent. She was good with credit cards and forms. and We'd rent furniture and keep it. Piano, her cameras. I didn't have to keep a list. You know where you stole something from. We want to run. <laughs> People in the family thought we were crazy. That stuff you asked me to put in my garage, is that stolen? Are you crazy? Don't you know I work for the government? Are you crazy, one of my uncles? You guys are just, come get that stuff out of here immediately. And no, you can't live here anymore. That's how we wound up stranded in Oakland. She started dancing at Lusty Lady. She was an actress and a, had a film company, Hawkeye Video. Her and I together with Hawkeye, I would edit it, she would go shoot it. She would shoot people's weddings or any function. Graduation. I didn't have no editor, Apple, photo, wa la la. And we didn't have two or three machines. So you know what I used to do? I used to take acetate, a clear piece of paper, and draw the credits in some kind of cool writing and place it over the television. And then we'd reshoot it again and I'd pull it up. If I want the credits to roll, I'd shoot it, lock, block the camera off. Take that one off, put the next credit, go back to that spot on the original tape. So every time, whatever we did for someone, when we got to the credits, it always went down a quality of blurriness. But it was still blowing people. Like, we love how you did this. Like, we weren't expecting that. So we, we making money doing all kinds of shit, man. But um, yeah, she was a brilliant camera person and actress, but she couldn't find no work like that. You know? She started dancing at Lusty Lady. Kind of you put 25 cents in, it goes up. <laughs> and for the first time, I learned that business. And she was telling me how. Some people come right in, put $5 and quarters in, lock the door, and start tying her dick up. Come here, do this. 
Do this. I said don't beat on the window. Do you want me to take this 20 to a different one? You, come here. She says, people out there doing shit and jacking on up. Some of them boots were crazy. A lot of people came home from a bad night. Back then, that's where you jacked off. There wasn't no computers and you couldn't do it at home. It's too, can't get caught by your family and shit. So people like Pee Wee Herman, a lot of people tell you we used to fuck in the Chinese movies. That's where you go, you can't get a room. But the peep show booths too. The peep show booths. We used to skip school at PS 180, go in the home room, get our credit for showing up that day. Between periods, sneak out, use our school passes to take the train an hour into Manhattan from PS 180s in Far Rockaway. And then we would just run around and do shit and look at shit. We're 12 and 13 years old, running, oh, spending the whole day in Manhattan. Let's go to the record store. You know, Sam Goody, we all Sam Goody. Yo, this is the mixer I'm gonna get. You ain't gonna get no mixer. You're broke ass. Oh, yeah, we're just having fun. I was like, hey, let's go to such and such. Looking at things like, wow, look at that. People doing sculptures in front of Rockefeller Plaza or whatever. And then sometimes we're like, yo, let's, let's go out. Let's go look at that peep booth. We run by the peep show booths. They wouldn't let us in. But still, we would sneak in. Ooh, you saw that? You saw that? We'd walk up to the prostitutes on 40 Views. Like, hey. Show me your pussy. She'd be like, what? You crazy. Please, show us your pussy, we should say. And she'd be like, take your little bad asshole. Like, Ooh, you see that nigga? Hey, let's go back by the river. Once you got one of those, you were good. Because we were too young to like, you know. We just like, wow, you saw that? That was a real pussy, you know. And then we have to get back so that I got off the bus with all the rest of the kids. Because if my mother knew, whoo, that's why I used to get beatings. She would find out we didn't go to the store that we said we was going to some person's house. We left the city on our bikes. We would be in Brooklyn on our bikes. Or when I lived in Tampa, St. Pete, we'd be in New Jersey. We'd cross the bridge on our bikes because it's just so much to see, you know. The jail used to get that whooping, man. Master Blasters. We were trying to make money. We wasn't trying to get in the music business. We thought that was surreal. That's just something that was apparently not us. Like Curtis Blow, Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Flash, Fears, Five Spoonie G. By the time it got to Run DMC, the way we sounded was over. And it seemed like if you weren't one of those first five or ten groups that got signed, that was it. We knew them ain't the dudes. Where's Shock Dell? Where's Charlie Chase? Where's Grandmaster Cass? Furious Five, they was the dudes. But some of them cats like Spoonie G and some of them first rap records and Sugar Hill Gang, nobody knew them. We knew who the dudes was. Master G had Phase Two, it was cool, you know. They were just starting to rhyme, but the cats, like Woody Wood in Brooklyn, 77, 78, MC Shock Dell in Queens, MC Charbonne in Queens, Mr. Ness, not the one with the Furious Five, a little kid. I'm Mr. Ness, I rock the serious joint. I'm a I had a tape with that Aerosmith. By the way, Run DMC, yeah, that was a great idea. That was Rick Rubin's idea or whatever, you know. But every DJ had to run, walk this way. That was just a break beat that you had to have as a standard. An uh, MC might ask for that. Yo, I like that one. Oh, you talking about one, yeah. And if you heard, ang, 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 the DJ's whack. You didn't get that off the turntable one time. You supposed to go, the whole time the MC rhymes. And when it's time to get the record off, more about you gotta get the next record on before we heard the guitar. We don't want to hear none of that shit. None of them singing on them old re James Brown records. Hey, looking at the man, Godfather. People, people, they, oh, that's my mama music. We just want to. There's no such thing as a drum machine. Funkin', 
down, boom, 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 that's when you throw it, and it's got them two wines, boom, boom, people used to appreciate that kind of shit, but, um, a lot of the people didn't happen. A few made it out. Even by the time Busy B was doing records, that style had moved on. And we were, that's how we sounded. I'm an old school MC. Like, when I felt like I could battle anybody was from 13 to 20 years old. By the time I was 21, I was just like, we were all discouraged that we had, didn't stay in New York and we had missed the wave of people that got signed and it's too late now. And, and now it, we don't even sound like the new people, which was Rakim, LL Cool J, Run DMC. We love them, but it's a, something we don't have that. It's not our generation. So when the Master Blasters dissolved, I just started studying piano for the first time in my life. Because I used to goof off and play things a little, but there was something about the piano that was just drawing me in. I could do the bass line, the chords, the melody. I could get more of the song done. And I just love certain songs so much that it's just dope to just see how that works. Wow, that's what they play. Yeah, that's it, ain't it? Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah, it's, the piano just drew me in. Then this instructor, who taught English class, happened to be a saxophonist. And he came knocking on the piano room one day at the school, and he said, I was like, Mr. Token, what you doing here? That was really his name. He was like, I, I heard you were down here. The, the security guard said, there's some kid that sits in here all night and can play a little bit. And then when he described me, described him, I knew it was you. He was my English teacher. You sound good. I was listening. Let me take you through to a few, through, few things. He said, you got to, have you taken that into a different key yet? I was like, no. Nah. Well, you got to learn it in, in the next key. What about this? Do you know the blues key? I said, like this? He was like, yeah. yeah. I said, you know the rock and roll? I said, yeah, these notes? I said, yeah, do you know? No, minor scale. I knew about four scales, that's all. He was like, okay, now let me see you do it in e, e flat. Huh? Uh, I haven't learned it in E flat yet. Same interval, son. He was like, start doing it in every key. Everything you know, play it in every key. The hardest one, the most difficult one for you, start with that one. And I just didn't believe him, like, a lot of old people was always saying, scales, scales is what you do, scales. But then I hit up where I knew I'm not getting any better. Or at least not. There's something missing. I could play everything. But I couldn't sit in with other people too much. And I was like, finally gave in and said, okay, I'm gonna practice scales. Everybody says that's something. And I started both hands. Learning shit in every key. <laughs> but before he came, one day the uh, the guy who locks the school up, just security guard, he'd come in the piano room. Sometimes I wouldn't stop. And he would just sit there and watch. Just let me get this, just let it go on, go on, on. But I gotta lock it up at 11. Eventually he was like, we gotta go now though, we do gotta go. I gotta lock it up. He said to me, you know, I've been listening to you all year, you getting better and better. You can do this, you can do this. Don't give up, keep going. Cause I, I can hear it. <laughs> So he started locking up everything around the school and always knew to come last. He would lock the piano room up last because he knew I wanted every second. Then I would have to take the bus home really far, a bus ride, and then walk really far. Because when my dad lived, the bus didn't go. We were in a new development. So 
I usually hitchhiked home or just took the bus. And by the time I got home, it'd be two in the morning sometimes. And then I got to get up at five to do the same thing again to get back to school. Yeah. HCC, Dale Navy Canvas, to be honest. <laughs> well, okay, I'm sorry, I got off the subject. But uh, I brought that up to say something, though. Um, as I started learning, it started drawing me in because of the way in which music unfolds when you learn it. It's like, wow. If you love music, the more you discover and learn, the more you love it. And, and I used to say, he's like, you in a band or something? You in a band? I was like, nah, not yet. I'm, I'm not good enough yet. I want to. He's like, why are you not good enough? I said, I just know I don't have that sound that people want. When I get there, he said, let me tell you something. You're never going to get there. He, he said, picture a light at the end of the tunnel you're trying to reach. And you know you're getting closer. But the closer you get, the brighter that light gets. He said, music's the same way. It's going to do that to you the rest of your life. You're never going to reach it. There's no end. And wow. It is crazy like that, man. It's just all of a sudden you start hearing the opposite harmony. Not the triads, not the woo woo. That's your paid out. If Digital Underground didn't happen, maybe I would have been a decent keyboard player. I'm all right, but these days I just do rhythm. But if I went for that, but it wasn't the thing to be doing in the 80s. It's like they weren't respecting keyboard players that much. There wasn't no room for it in hip hop. Prince was cold. That solo he took in Soft Wet, we recognized like, whoo, he just ripped everybody in the game. But, and anytime someone did something hot like that, whoever played piano on the solo of This Masquerade, George Benson, he changed the game with that. Same thing with Prince's Soft and Wet. Changed the game with it. Everybody else used to have to slow the thing down to play that fast. And then speed the tape back to normal speed. But Prince would play it that fast at the session. Yeah. A computer love, that's different. They slow the track down and program it. Yo, ask Steve Counter, he was the engineer. Same song solo, one continuous take. Might not have been the first one. Could have been the second or third. I know I did two or three different solos, but it was just one take. Have fun with that. Um, between the ages of 18 and 23, 24, I wouldn't even date a girl unless she had a piano. Really. Because if she didn't have a piano, I knew I wasn't going to spend much time in her house. She was going to break up with me anyway. I was always the last person to leave any party that had a piano in it. Sometimes people around, sometimes just me by myself, trying to figure it out further. Figure it out further. Um, the saxophone player, English teacher, moved out, of, you know, became out of my life. I left that school. But I always remember what he said. Got to learn the blues, baby. It all comes from the blues. We started discovering the blues. Wow. You can hear it. You can just look at the whole path that it went from Jelly Roll Morton, 1900, to jazz and swing, to rock and roll, to... That vine, you can see it, to funk, disco, which hip hop, you know, that way, over this way, rock splitting into all these different genres, R&B becoming these different things. So, they were right, if you learn the blues, if you're a soloist and you learn the blues, then it, you can play anything American, meaning country, jazz, funk, Rock is all, you know. And when we started noticing that, it was hard to not get sucked in by that. I've been through P-Funk for years. I've been through hip-hop. But I was just, went through about three-year phase of listening to nothing but jazz records. Nothing but Ray Charles. We digging in the crates. We used to play 1947 Ray Charles records. Me and my little brother. We discovered them by accident. They weren't even popular. It was back when he wasn't. They was all recorded in Tampa and up and down Florida. 
that string of blues records, woo, he got one where he said, sitting here thinking, nothing left to do. I'm sitting here thinking, nothing left to do. Let's go downtown. Cause I've got a dollar to <laughs> And you can hear it. Like there ain't nothing to do. In the South, sometimes that shit was crazy. We used to say funny stuff too though. We found records that were saying stuff like, hip hop, everything is going through, blues and rock went through it. You know, they be like playing, hip hop's out of control. What was rock doing when, what was jazz doing when it was Frank Sinatra and you know, Sammy Davis and all them cats, the rap, we rich, we the black, the, the ballers, Jaguars only, and they wasn't grimy cats. So the art form, when it gets to that age, it's gonna get interested in jewelry and money. As soon as it gets to that age, when it's a teenager, it's sexed out, just like a real teenager. When hip hop was in the 80s, it was sexed out, party out, that's what a 12 through 20 year old does. That's a trip. Then when it got 30 years old, 25 to 30 years old, the onset of the 90s, that's when the gangster movement happened. And it got, it got tough, just like people do when they turn 21, 22 and get arrested a couple times and or get a few things to happen to them where it's just like, man, I got it's time to be responsible. Out of the kid zone. So, it all went through it, but there's a blues record that says, Now I'll do more for you, baby, mm -mm 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 -mm, than the good Lord ever done. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I said, I'll do more for you, baby, mm -mm -mm -mm, than the good Lord ever done. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I took you downtown and brought you some hair, pretty mama, because the good Lord never gave you none. <laughs> Da -da -da. Now give me back that wig I bought you, baby. Da -da -da -da. If you dig in the crates, there's some blues that, of course, BB King and Bobby Blue Bland. They became the Jay Z's and the, you know, they became those cats. But the random artists that came through that game was just ridiculous funny, and they were more gangster too. Hip hop music is not the first time that. You know, everybody say the 60s, African Americans were more together in this country because we had to stick together to survive and at least we knew what side we was on. But these days, these kids don't know nothing. I'm like, well, it's a different world now, you know. It's a different world, but... So you think, all the love songs, people say, I can't imagine Marvin Gaye blasting Stevie Wonder, Pop and Biggie, like what? Man, well, Marvin Gaye's father shot him. They couldn't imagine it in Motown, because Motown was a pretty company, you know, a, a, a flossy company, just like Def Jam was compared to, say, Death Row. But Death Rose was out there. You know, chess records, look at them cats. There's a lot of pressure. They're shooting each other over anything. So it's not the first time that the music's gotten gangsters, is all I'm saying, you know. But, uh, okay, yeah, so now I'm getting offers to play keys for people. Just because I did a couple of music showcases for people at the school who would say, hey, I heard you play piano. Great, could you do a song for me? And this thing, I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Whoa, these hot chicks is asking me to do shit, you know? This one girl wanted to sing Turn Around every now and then. And another girl wanted to sing um, in junior high school. A girl wanted me to learn, can it be that it was all so simple? What was time around? So I would learn all these songs just to do the gig. Then people start seeing those. Sometimes the girl won the talent show. 
Greg, I just want to thank you so much. I just like, don't worry about it. Are you good? Later. I just couldn't wait to leave with the 50 bucks you said she would give me for it. Uh, but, um, Warren Brooks pulled me into his band. Freddie Jacobs had me playing key keyboards in his band. They was like an Earth, Wind, and Fire kind of band. Warren Brooks was like too princed out. He was one of the bands that everything he likes had to be have some prints in it. Mars Day in the Time, Ready for the World. So, and Onyx. I used to play keyboards from LA band called Onyx. Kenny McLeod, Holy Group, but the lead singer, he had it too. Just like Pop clones. I know you meet them. I meet them too. How many people heard somebody's CD and you were like, this is good Tupac. But unfortunately, it's, there's nobody would buy this because you can listen to Tupac. It's too much Tupac. And there's cats that love Pac so much, they don't care. And they feel like, this is new Pac. If Pac was alive, this is, this is good. This is Those who want more new songs from him should listen to me. You know? I get those demos sometimes, and I, I consider it. I always, this is all the time when Pac was alive, even after he was dead, of course. I played a demo for everybody in the clique. I'm like, yo, listen to this guy. This is dope, right? This is funny, listen. They're like, man, he'll get shot. Or he'll get jumped. Like, nah, man, that's disrespectful to Pac. I was like, well, Pac ain't here. We like Stevie Ray Vaughan because he sound like Hendrix, you know. Listen to the first two Michael Jackson albums. He was doing James Brown. Rock With You, that's Michael Jackson. You know, the 80s. But, I want you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you back. Nah, 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 nah. Oh, baby, baby. I want you. Baby! That's James Brown all day. That's beautiful. Then George Clinton told me when he did Flashlight, he was doing Michael Jackson. That's funny as fuck. <laughs> he heard it without the bass line. Just a ding -a -ling, a ding -a -ling, a ding -a ding And drums. He's like, yeah, Bootsy gave me a track of just drums and guitar. It sounded like the Jackson 5. I didn't know what to do with it, so I tried doing Michael over it. I lay me down to sleep. Oh, I just can't find the flash. He said he was really thinking like a Michael Jackson song because he didn't know what to do with this track. And then they added the keyboards and then it blossomed into that. I never was a part of that. You can't be influenced by someone else. So I like the bike. I'm just joking, but but I do, you know, I do like borrow ideas from people and, and without hiding it. Like, yeah, I love that. I want to get some of that. Yeah, you know, I want to do some of that. Like, to me, you can do enough records. I'm going to do, I'm going to do some more of that. If an artist stopped existing who was holding me down a certain way, I might start doing that just for myself. That's what those records were for that wound up being a digital and all stuff. I just made those to send to my friends. And I want to present to you a gift for you, for the crew. This is a gift? Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, brother. Just to keep it for, for the team. Look at that. This was like the second, this is the second or third Tommy Boy 8x10. That's the second or third. The first one had three pictures on top and the group picture. Had a big group picture and then up here it was like on three hundred. And then the middle one was like shot G. I'm trying to be all serious. And the next one was Anthony Blomberg. Had the jaws and shit. Mmm. We had some that was just humpy too. They would do that to us. Just running around and just showing nose. Sometimes not even a black one. Just a white nose with the stuff on it. Like, like Tom, that's not. You know, it's a billboard uh, spring writer's edition, something, something with a big, thick 
thing in the middle and every record company is representing themselves. And you get to the Tommy Boy spread and it would say, Naughty by Nature, a picture of him, Queen Latifah, a picture of him, Stats of Sonic, uh, 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 so Digital Underground, and it would just be a white nose and glasses that from a regular joke store. That was so insulting to us, like in two ways. First, you're just reducing the group to that. But at least use one of ask me for one of mine, or at least paint it. <laughs> you just had to know. Like, yo, Tom is just that guy. And the story behind the nose, the accident with the deep fryer, Humpty Hump, and much more, let us know more about it. I don't remember that one. Okay. I think it, it started out like this. Born in 1967 to parents Emma May and Wilfred Humphrey. Eddie, Eddie Humphrey, better known, now known as Humpty Hump. The singing thing started with Smooth Eddie and the Humpers at Blue Ship. He was a singer. All the places that I used to mention were places I used to play piano at in the Humpty Vial. So, at least it wasn't a total lie. But we had to do the backstory after he came about. So I'm just like, well, Humpty's from Tampa. He is my Uncle Tony Red all day. Eddie, we're going to get this cutlass running. Just these two pieces of the carburetor left. Woo, Tony Green! He would just sit out and watch TV after he took my dad's car apart. Uncle Tony, you weren't right, man. Yeah, I'll take another bit. Woo, touchdown! My dad walking around. I'm, 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 I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Whoa! I'm Tony Red. Collar used to be up sometimes. Shirt pattern was too much. But he was the coolest cat in the world. You couldn't tell he wasn't cool, you know. In his head, you know. So, Slim, you know. Bootsy, Slick Rick, of course. Benny Hill. In the thinking. <laughs> but if I'm really talking or doing an interview and I'm on the spot and I, I was backstage and I'm humping MTV is real quick, sometimes I think what would Tony have said, Uncle Tony? How would he have answered this? And that's how we could get it, you know? Yeah, yeah, huh? This is a, this is a polar bear. What I used to call it, it's a virgin polar bear pussy hair coat. 19 virgin polar bears make this to show you only the pussy is. Whatever. It just was. That's the type of shit he would say. He was just a crazy guy. But yeah, Humpty evolved. So I went back and said, The Smooth Eddie and the Humpers used to be a lounge act. And before I moved to Oakland, the last place I, things I did around Florida was I played piano with Rough Riders, which was in the spaghetti warehouse building uh, complex built into HCC campus, Ebor City campus. Carmine's was another jazz spot, something like 22nd and 7th Avenue with the main drag, had a piano. Dude used to let me play for tips and be the entertainment on certain nights. But I can't pay you. But if you're good, you could use the piano, but you gotta be good. You ever heard of that? I was like, he plays here sometime. I was like, oh, he saw a look on my face. I knew I wasn't that good yet. I was like, well, if you got him, you might not like what I play. He was like, no, nah, he wants too much. <laughs> so I was only two years into playing the piano. I was already had little gigs here and there. and It was fun, man. Play synthesizers with Warren Brooks Band. We would win the Ballad of the Bands. He won it with his songs. Uh, Digital Underground or whatever we was calling ourselves. Like the Master Blasters. We won. We placed two. The radio station. One band will be picked for a Polygram Records record contract. Contestants must do it. Can't be longer than this. Send it in to such and such and such. Radio thing. And for the grand finale, we'll be in August. The Ballad of the Bands. This was all summer. We would play so a lot of times. I got one in there, Freddie had one in there, Warren had one. We all had our own bands because we didn't like each other's music. He, all he liked was Earth, Wind & Fire. 
Freddie Jacobs. No relation. And all Warren like was Prince. And they thought I was too P funked out. If I made something I thought was hot, listen to me. Yeah, 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 it's cool, it's cool. But you on that George Clinton thing. Let me show you how it's supposed to go, man. Let me show you how it's supposed to go, man. That's Warren Brooks. He used to dance and dress like Prince. And then Freddie Jacobs. Every 25 was there all dancing and throwing the feet up and they had all that stuff. It was funny. But uh, yeah, anyway, those gigs were. It's the stuff that I used in the Humpty Bio, so it wasn't a total, you know. But there was no smooth lady in the Humpers. You know. Whose voice was destroyed by a grease fire. Backlash of that was um, disabled rights companies and hospitals and organizations around the United States demanding I make public apology for using retarded and so on. And what are you retarded? Do you work for the Klan? But we want you to apologize to. I said, ain't you not gotta do it? Imagine, I think you should do it. Huh? Why? For what? He was like, no, but they'll launch war on you. War? What kind of war? He's got college students that help him do stuff. I was like, what just... Okay, for example, when he gave me one, but they have a lot of them. But he said, they go around the record stores around the United States, and they go buy a record or two or whatever, but while they're in there, they take all your product, and they one by one put them behind a classical record and bury it behind a such and such. They move your CDs to places nobody would ever look for them. And just the amount of time that it takes for them to restock it, and the two weeks that you didn't have it, that nobody had it, and the time that they discover them, that they're around the store, that's it, they cut your record sales in half. That's the difference between, I was like, wow, that's dope. I was like, hell yeah, all right, I'll apologize. But I'll probably whatever they want. <laughs> But no handicapped people were mad at me. Just the organizations that protect them. They knew I didn't mean that retarded just meant that's sick, you know, like a, a doper form of you know, and it was already a hip hop word in the seventies. You know, that's ill. It was way, you know. Mm -hmm. And wrapping up, on with Tommy Boy, signing with them in the early nineties. Share some of the best times and with Schmoovy Schmoo. Okay. Um, being on Tommy Boy was a journey to all of us. Our manager, Atrian at TNT Records, he was Pac's first manager. He, TNT was his thing. He was shopping us and then he said, if You guys are going to be on Friday? I, want, I got some good news for you. We're like, What? What? Tell us now. I got three companies interested. I'm not sure I might, but by Friday, don't worry about it. You guys go rehearse. He came over and said, oh, well, Virgin is interested. And we were like, really? Oh, that's dope. I looked at mine, mine looked at him. You know, you know, and he said, another big label. I forget which one. And he said, and the third one is Tommy Boy. We went, Tommy Boy? Yo! That's crazy. Really? That was an honor, because Tommy Boy had Stats of Sonic, you know, all those records. It was just, it was a hip hop label. Everybody was dope they had. Back to Africa Bad Body. You know, I didn't love all their records. Some of the Johnson Crew ones I didn't mess with, but I messed with Pac Jam and I messed with, you know. But, Fresh Gordon, remember him? Um, just dope. So that's a sonic hip hop band. They even tried to put Riz out once. It's Raheem. We know you, Raheem. Ladies, man. Yep. Yeah. Do everything you can. If someone says they want you to be a background vocalist in their group, try it. Someone wants you to dance for them, try it. Look what that did for Pac. You know, Jay Z was in a crew with one of the e EPMD dudes, all like, you know. <laughs> Some old school, just fat laces way off. No, I used to be called the new style. You ever seen them album covers? Woo! 
<laughs> Funny shit. Can't occupy two places at one time. Plus, life is so random. In order for time, like every time travel movie, you can always put a hole in. That couldn't happen because the little kids poke holes in that. But it's an intriguing subject. So, of course. But he used to get mad at me. Nah, man, you don't see what I'm saying. If you went back and stopped yourself from doing it, then you wouldn't have to do that because then you wouldn't have met that person. We were getting hard ones all night, so we knew not to talk about time travel. After that, he's showing me this, and I know that this is impossible. The fact that you think you're going to get a grant from the government to have a pill that induces a wet dream with who you want it to be, that's, look, that's beyond wet dreams or acid or hallucinogenic. That's too, we don't have that yet. Maybe the outcome one day, but you would probably have to wire someone's brain up and I don't even know. But I knew the technology wasn't there. But I love you, Smooth, for just trying to do that. And I, I said, you know, this would make a cold song. It was like, I was like, I tell you what, let me do, do a song out of it. Get on it with me, man. Let's, let's make it dope. I said, but then at least... At least there's more awareness of it. Maybe the government will mess with you. I just like the idea of it. He was like, okay, cool, yeah, because I want to get the song. And then when he was still working on trying to get the money to, to make them. I just thought that was an adorable, open-minded story on his part of just he's really going for that. You know? Is he still at it? No, nah, he let that go. But But we did know... That something like that would probably have properties that ecstasy had, LSD. So we started learning the ingredients and we wanted to have the, the backstory sound believable. GSRA, genetic suppression of these animals. Then one day he came over and I was like, listen to this, sex package, a dollar or two. The, the chords I already was playing at, just something I was just writing but I wasn't sure what I was writing. And then that. Then he came on it. He's the one that sings like Curtis Mayfield. I'm not getting it with your heart. I'm just feeling what you need. Uncontested ecstasy. <laughs> yeah. But by the same token, he had this arrogance about him, about how when he puts together his rhapsody orchestra, it's going to be like he. he you and Pee Wee and Tupac and Money B and y'all and that little hippity hop thing y'all do, that's cool. But wait till this comes out. Rhapsody Orchestra's gonna be like this and that. And that rock elements and jazz and funk elements. And him and Jimmy, Chopmaster J also. Wait till Force One Network comes out. Big Brother Soul. He felt like if Shock's little songs can do that, wait till they hear my songs. Not because of me in particular, just because we were rappers. And R&B minded cats in the late 80s, they didn't get it. They're like, but you stealing somebody else's music. I said, how come you can't respect a DJ if you could respect a famous photographer? He didn't paint that bridge. All he did was say, yeah, but didn't I catch it at the right time of night? No, I don't know nothing about bridge building. Didn't I catch it at the right time of night? With the city behind it? Woo! Most popular picture of the Bay Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge is by artists so and so. I was like, yo, what's different? The hip hop DJ, we don't care. We didn't make. He don't care. I don't can't play a bass. I can't do this. I didn't write that James Brown record. But isn't this the best four seconds of it? Ain't that the spot? If you go and grab it, and don't it sound right with the kick right here? And isn't this MC shredding that shit? The R&B dudes were like really holding out. M2 May talking bad about hip hop. A lot of R&B artists, when they interview them, it's like, well, you know, well, you're right. First of all, it's not music. Second of all, how can it not be music? Oh, but your percussionist is. His patterns count as music. 
But 50 cents patterns don't. That shit was crazy to me. Tretch, from Naughty by Nature, truncated his flows. Have you ever met a girl that never on a nice hello? He always puts it where it's supposed to be and it locks in every time. But I know I was never one of those dudes like, it falls where it falls. When I try to write the flow too much, as you see. <laughs> and Tupac Shakur, So Many Tears, being on the disc inspired by Pac's poetry. Anything you like to elaborate on his legacy and this picture. Smooth, I hope you help you healthy, man. I don't know what you're doing down there, but hope you're taking care of you. Yup. Yeah, we, we needed Smooth to love himself a little more than we felt he was at the time. And it was just like, wasn't representing the group in the best ways. So we went our way, you know. But uh, that was some great time. We would work on music in the living room until our chicks were sitting there like this, just like y'all are right now. Like, my girl's sitting in a chair. Lori's in bed, hair snoring from the other room. That's his girl. They know once they start talking about music, or once they start making something on the four track, it was a wrap. They didn't complain, they would just go to sleep. Like, we're finally waking them up at sunrise. Yo, listen to this. We put it in, like, what time is it? Oh my god, I gotta be at work an hour. Man. You gotta stay up all night. I miss you, baby. Where are you? You know, girls always trying to pull you out of it. I was like, no, no, I'm not serious. Listen to this. Listen. That's you singing? I like it. I like it. That's what Melissa used to say. Yo. That's a drip. Nobody in our families reacted to any of our music. Nothing we made at home, all the stuff we sent in over the years to record companies trying to get in those ballad bands, you know. Jimmy called me at Music Unlimited one day and said, hey, my friend in L.A. wants to uh, put us in the studio and wants to put you out. If you do, you got to put me in the group. We split everything 50-50. Cool? Cool? I'm like, what? The dude, Taboo Records. I said, Taboo Records? Yeah, they're going to fly you out later. But you, you gotta put me in the group, all right? All right, yeah, whatever. Yo, I gotta go. I'm sorry, I'm gonna help you. Yes, you know, come at work. Plus, I was just like, yeah, right, I'm not. Never going back to that. When you try to get in the music business for 10 years and it don't happen, more than that, 12, ages 12 through 20, 25 even, up to I was 24 when Jimmy, 25, 23, something like that. So that's 13 years. After a while, you can't go through that no more. We sent in, we, we placed. It took all year to figure out what we're going to do next year when it comes on the radio again. And then we, it should be this song. No, we should do this. I'm telling you what we need is while everybody in the group saying, this is what we got to do, this is what we got to do. And then we place. Whoa! We want to do, we gotta do the showcase now. Then it's like, alright, um, let's start rehearsing. And then we go do that. And because WTMP was a southern rooted gospel owned station, no matter who was in that contest every year, gospel groups would win. Freddie Jacobs should have won once. The open song. Then the next year I was in it with Warren's band and our group. We didn't call it Digital Now. We just called it, I forget what we called it. We had a name back then, like Chill Factor. Something like That's that. right, Chill Factor. It was something like that, but uh, I forget what we would call it. Yeah, it was Chill Factor, then you had the Four Horsemen. We thought Master Blasters and shit like that was too hip-hop for Florida. So... We didn't think the radio station was pick us. We needed something that sounded more like what they liked. Something like that. But all right, chill factor. 
Alright. Such and such and such. Edith Langston in the Gospel Mints. Couple people. Yeah. Like, damn, you heard that? It sounds like we might have won. I don't know. What about her? What about Deidre so and so? So it's out of us three. We knew it was out of Deidre, Warren, or us. Edith Langston in the Gospel Mints. Everybody on stage went, is this really happening? Even people in the audience like, ah, like, come on, let's go home. They're just used to it. It's just Bible Belt. Gospel, gospel. Love Willie D for that, man. Niggas and flies. Black radio stations running they flat, talking about how they don't play rap. But rap pay the bills, motherfucker. To keep a nigga out of jail, cocksucker. Woo! I love this bad. I was like, Willie D. Willie D for president. Because there was a lot of people who fronted on rap first was the black radio stations. But anyway, two or three, uh, two, three, five years of sending things out to like record companies and paying people to give us a package. And just, we tried everything. And then after a while, it just wasn't something that I wanted to put that much into anymore. It's like, it takes too much out of you. Not to not get picked, but to know you won. That's when you're like, this shit is a fucking rig up. So later when I wound up getting a job on that same radio station, I would play knee deep for 15 minutes and I'd play none of the commercials, do none of the drops. <laughs> they call me Bracadelic. 15 minutes. Phones are ringing. And I can tell these are the business phones. I wouldn't answer for a long time. And towards the end. What are you doing? You didn't play the you didn't play the call letters at the top. That's an FCC rule. W T U V. You didn't do the news report ten minutes after the hour. Woo! I said, yeah, I just, I just thought the fifteen minute you wanna need to bump one time. I need deep. Woo! Well, take it off immediately. Alright, alright. Well, it's almost over anyway. Let it still play. Ooh, they hated that shit. Like, you gotta know. <laughs> so I got fired from that shit. That's it. But it's such an honorable reason. Yeah, I played Trans Europe Express the whole record. Rappers Delight the whole record. We was blowing up Tampa so hard that people ran up to me at Chamberlain High School and said, Graham, you made a record. I said, what? You made a record. Me? Yeah, I heard you on the radio today. I heard you. Hip hop, hip hop. I was like, no, no, that's Sugar Hill Gang. That's Mike, I'm trying to tell you, man, that's what everybody's doing in New York right now. It's just like, oh, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. Sometimes in Tampa, you put on a break beat, they would clear the floor out. They'd be like, oh, got to keep it funk and popular records. Put on Love is the Message or one of them good old, you know, Wow! Da 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 da! This is, this is, da 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 da! All those records you were gonna hear at any hip hop party you went to. That's why later we're all snatching them up, making records out of them. Those were all standards already. That's what people who weren't living in New York didn't know. They always thought that. Run DMC's idea was to bring Aerosmith into the hip hop world. Or, you know, Sugar Hill Gang idea was to bring Sheik into it. Any of us. But all the records, most of the records that became the backbeats and the records that hip hop records copied all the way up to about 91, all of them were hip hop standards that DJs had two in the crate. Because we didn't have any way to extend it for the MC besides doubling it. You know? They didn't have an instrumental funky president. So you had to keep the beginning going. You had to keep the break going. So, yeah. APMD is the first people to pull. Womp, 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 womp. None of us. 
Everybody from New York knew that. You hear all those records at every other hip hop party when the MC start rhyming. But but we all evolved. That's true. Tommy boy. When I first though got to Oakland, I had MC Gene and DJ Cal. He was a chubby cat with Jerry Curls. And the DJ. And MC Gene was somebody I was producing. I was making beats for him. We met in the store. But he was also like, when I say producing, I mean just helping to make a demo. There's no money involved. There's no real studio involved. Doing this shit at home. But I was the go to man. And by the same token, when I did a show, I bring MC Gene in. So, DeVita, my fiance, Cal, and MC Gene together was called Spice. We just wanted to call it that. And we were kind of half RB, half hip hop. We would do both. But we did shows too. Spice Machine, we did shows around Oakland. We'd have props. I had someone build me a, a, a noose thing, like you see back in the slavery days. A big wooden thing and the whole everything. Almost looked like a guillotine. And we had a, a dummy hanging from it. We were kind of real enough. And his shirt says Sucker MC. And all throughout our show, every time we go out, like, the thing y'all MCs don't understand, we always hit it. And then we go, you know how it just added funny shit to the show. Sucker, sucker, yeah, yeah. And it looked menacing. It was big and tall, 12 feet high, because to hang a person, I guess I had to, I'd say, I want it to look like one. He said, all right, what size do you want? I said, just like one. And just this dude I know who's good with wood. So when it was first up, it was irking people in the park that day where the show was, like, people would walk by and go, what is that? It was in the street. But then that night when it filled up and people were doing their shows, when you saw that come to the stage, I saw it in the audience. I saw people going like, yo, who's next? Who's that? MC Gene, MC Stick, and the Spice Regime. <laughs> Fun to walk by that thing. So when I seen Dre hold Easy's head up and walk around, I, I feel you know, because yeah, that's what you do, you know. Mm. The props for that. It's hard to keep talking and think about some of these people, and it's just it pulls you into wondering what they're up to. And then Gene had to go to the military overseas. MC Gene from Oakland left. He was one of the first people I met and worked with. So then Dancer joined the group. Dancer was a singer. Looked like Big Bang Hank. I liked him in the group because he was big and he wore the Big Bang Hank caps. And he looked like Hank a little bit. But he was a singer. Totally R&B cat. So then we changed it to excuse me, Spice Regime. And then DeVita and I broke up and then, you know, I don't know where people went, but Dancer oh, I gotta help my dad do something down in Mississippi. That crew split. Oh. Cal, TJ Cal's mother wouldn't let him do certain stuff with us, like, as long as it doesn't have too much cursing on it. So he couldn't put the scratches on certain songs because it had cursing in it. So that's when we replaced him with Kenny K. And then it was the Spice Regime. But then when Jimmy said, Taboo Records, my friend in LA, who produces Barry White, wants to record those two songs over. That I had recorded at his house on a four track, just showing him how to use the equipment. Made a house call to one of my customers to show him how to use it. I sold him my dream system. I was broke, I couldn't afford all that stuff. You know, I had money, but not that kind of money. I had a dope keyboard and a drum machine, that's it. But Jimmy 
came in with a credit limit and it, I sold him my dream setup. I was like, he was like, what do I need to make records? I was like, well, you probably want some kind of a clock. So you use this as a sequencer. Uh, I said, let me put that together for you. Come back tomorrow. And he came back. I was like, look, this is what you want. You want speakers? You want your four track right here because you can make this. Video. And it came to like five or six grand. He needed house calls. I was like, cool, I'll show you how to use it. Just let me record some stuff I want to make. So I just mixed it down while I'm showing them. See this? And this is what you want to do. Uh, I said, yeah, I'll leave that in for you. So if you can try to see all mixes and stuff, mix it down. All right, peace. I'll see you next time. Uh, I was like, ah, this is dope. Just made copies of it to Sim, K Bar, and Kenny K. And just send a shot in New York. Shati. I didn't think I ate all of it. Just... So maybe there's something to be said about not giving up too. But also there's definitely something to be said about don't think you know exactly what you're supposed to be. Pursue it. But music is music. Do everything you can do. It all helps. It all helps. The bigger your scope, the more people your music's going to tracked you know and I think it's pretty obvious that Kanye and Diddy and Jay-Z they listen to a lot of different things you know yep but if you're like this you're not gonna find it J-Lo was dancer and she did, did it she got around to doing what she wanted to do but and Pac as you see was doing anything um you like to touch base on the picture? This picture? You re can recall where that's from. Money B picked out the blue pajamas that him and Pac used to match and wear. Because the thing was, this looks like... This looks like doing sex packets. This particular picture is doing sex packets. You know why? Because we used to... You couldn't grow up with female back then on stage. You couldn't pump over a girl on the floor. We couldn't even have afforded to bring three girls with us on tour anyway. So I think that's what the idea for the dolls came from. We wanted to do this choreography with girls but there wasn't no way we can do it. So we put wigs and lingerie on blow up dolls and laid them out and did our thing to the music with that. We used to always, to the beat. We'd lean over them, and then we'd go boom, 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 boom. And you see all three of us, Pac's ass, my ass, and Mun's ass going boom, 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 boom. The girls used to go crazy. Ooh, oh God. And then it used to get into a different part of the sex pack is with something about oral sex and then we turn around and 69 them and sometimes when they did it that way they turn around Pac and Mun used to wear matching zebra briefs not even briefs, panties kind of you know, back then brothers would wear those sometimes, certain people you know not g-string up their butt or nothing but still shit that was not hip hop later when boxes and thugging and all that came in but there was still a few people who wore briefs? I guess they did. I was always a boxer cat. I had some shit like that though, just in case of a special date or something. But they went and got the sexy underwear out of the porno store and made them zebra. I got the zebra hat on. So when we spun around at 69 the dolls, they just had an ass in the public's face. So some cities would arrest us immediately. We told you guys can't gyrate, can't this, can't that. Sometimes we do, we promise we wouldn't, and the sheriffs and police would be lined up at the side of the stage to see if we did, and we would do it anyway, and then jump into the audience to get away after the show. Because Z would come on stage and be like, man, I'm spreading the word around. The, we're going to the dressing room or something, they're going to arrest you as soon as you get off stage. Let Mon know. I'm going to tell Pop. So we finished the show, Humpty Dance last song, 
Like, yo, don't let them take us to jail, jail, y'all. Public enemy up next. We did this on the ground. Hey. And we just started. Actually, I said, you go first, because then they won't know the show's ending. And, you know, so maybe somebody like Smooth went first. Or something. And then when me, Mon, and Pac is last, because we got mics. And right when it ended, we jumped down the audience. Man, the people in the pit, they grabbed me. I remember, like, look, look, look. I said, wait, 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 wait. Hide me. Oh, word, word, okay. And then they ducked out. Come on, bro, we got you. He gives you out of the hotel. Because if I didn't stop him, this girl wanted to tie this guy. It was just like, I would have been naked. It's going down in my clothes. We ran in the bathroom, and the dude let me switch outfits. Well, I put this on. Somebody we just met out of the blue. Put this on, he put on a Humpty coat. I said, is this the, yeah, I need that. And I pulled my ski hat on. And everybody did something similar, and one by one, we got back to the hotel and told each other story. How'd you get here, how'd you get here? But Pac got arrested because <laughs> Pac took a bad route to run. And he was unlucky. When he ran up into the rafters, the light from the back of the Coliseum followed him up, thinking it was part of the show. And the cops just followed him straight up there and arrested him. We go right and disappeared into the sea of people, you know. This is when I knew that whatever you see and hear on TV is often very untrue. Or there's one tiny thing of truth about it. Everything else is... Because the next day the paper said, Humpty Hump arrested for sexual gyrating on the show. This one underground, I'm on tour, public anyway. They knew that wasn't Humpty. But Tupac wasn't known yet. So they wanted a story. So they just put, that's when I knew every time I saw in the paper, you know, Tupac's cited questioning guns, kill kid getting shot, or this, that. Them things, I didn't lose my cool just because I got that phone call and saw it on TV. But my mother, What's wrong with him? I, I, what, I don't know, Mom. I'm trying to find out like everybody else. Uh, is he crazy? What's wrong with your friend? God, uh, Mom, calm down. Let me see what might happen. Come to find out. His ballistics were nice and this and that. Uh, but they were put too hard. Humpty Hump arrested for this. No, I wasn't. <laughs> that shit was funny. Um, wow, man. Pac, though, he didn't mind getting arrested. He didn't care. We have to bail him out. Him and the loonies. If you had a school on tour or Tupac on tour, you just keep the bail money on the bus in the safe or wherever. We knew we had. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a lot of cash on us. We would just send the money into the accounts and pay people to do checks. And you know, everybody got a little money on them. But we kept big, huge sums of cash to get people out of jail so they didn't miss the next show. And we tried that. And a lot of times, man, we didn't deserve it to go to jail for whatever that was. It's just like there was so much in the Bible Belt. The slightest thing, we're going to arrest y'all. You know, the sheriffs that had to stand there and watch us make all that money. All those girls screaming. You could see it all. They didn't want to be there. They didn't want to be in that parking lot, and it was just, when a fight break out, they wait a long, long enough for hopefully someone to get hurt so they can arrest somebody. They don't walk over there and break it up. You know, not everybody's like that, of course, but we saw a lot of that stuff. When I got married in 94, talking to my mom about the plans, yeah, yeah, and this, that, so when the people arrive, this was a, is your friend going to be there? Who? Your friend. Who, ma? Tupac? <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. I hope so. I invited him. He might be busy. I, I hope he makes it. <sighs> well, I hope you have a metal detector. I was like, Ma, he's not like that when he's around us. Not at all. But, the shit on TV about Pac is starting to look sketchy and Maybe he's a different cat now. I've seen him evolve into three, four different people just in the three years I know him. Maybe he does need a gun. Uh, but I, I was just, nah. 
I thought my better mind. Pac has so much sh stress and pressure and enemies and people that he had to keep his eyes on. And people around him working closely with him who don't know him, didn't grow up with him. He knew those people wasn't watching his back. Those new people popping up being his friends who weren't there before the fame. So when he was around us, he, he was like, it's like he was back home again. Yeah, hey, check this out. Guess what? He just turned to a kid immediately. And you could tell he liked the fact that he didn't have to worry about guns. The fact that he didn't have to watch his back. But um, Pop did show up. 11 deep entourage. When we got married, it was on a ship in San Francisco that stayed docked on a beautiful August night. And um, 94. Beautiful August night. I think it was August 4th. It was clear at 70 degrees with a light breeze at night. That's rare for the bay. Not a cloud in the sky. Every star twinkling. And it was a big boat. Bottom floor, Tony, Tony, Tony playing on one end. Oh, members of the group, just it's an open jam session. But it's, you know, Raphael Sadiq and Human Flavor, Josh Jones, all them cats. Then on this side, the main room, this is the reception. The wedding was 50 people. The reception was 500 people. The main floor was my motion. He was one of the most respected hip hop DJs in the Bay for, for playing hip hop parties, not a stage DJ. He doesn't do studio stuff, he doesn't scratch under rappers. He's just a DJ. So my motion is cranking it. Then on the top floor, most of the stuff's on the bottom floor. The engineer who did Future Rhythm, Mike Denton, he said, I got something I'm going to do for you as a gift, a wedding gift to you and Melissa. He said, man, you ain't tasted the shrimp cocktail until you taste it. I know I do it. Don't worry about it. How much you need for it? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to do it. He spent a thousand dollars in shrimp so that we can have a free shrimp bar. Here's the food, regular food, catering. Here's the regular bar. And then a long section of the boat was just iced shrimp with certain things and I forget all his recipe. And people used to walk up and how much are the drinks? It's, it's no cost. Really? That's dope. I paid the bar. But Mike Denton, that was that made it a hit. A lot of people was like, man, no free trip. Not even free, just the taste of them. But yeah, you know, and it never ran out. He did a lot. Then two floors up, his offices and shit on the second floor. Two stories up was third floor, I guess, is the roof of the ship, and saxophone player was on one side, playing love songs all night. That was his job. He was happy to be there after I hired him. We found him in the street, just playing Godfather one night. It was echoing through the streets. He was just... And it's always damp in Frisco. So at night, when you hear something like that, it sounds amazingly beautiful. If the person's good, and I was like, yo, I'm looking for a, You play love songs too? You want to do a wedding? All right, yeah, for sure. Give me another one. Then there was another one that we liked almost as good as him. His job was if he has to go to the bathroom, if he wants to eat anything, you replace him. So I want constant love songs on the roof. The entire six hours. If I go up there, if anybody tells me there's no music up there, then I'm not gonna pay y'all the other half. You know, is that that's very important to me. My bad. That's very important. He's like, oh, no problem. So they they did that. As soon as you got out of earshot of the saxophone, the other side of the boat was too far. You couldn't hear that no more. When you got to that end, we had a harp player there. She was the only harp player, so she would take a break every now and then. But She's playing love songs too in a heart. Over the years, I meet people who say, we met at your wedding, and now we're married. We, we met on the roof at your wedding. <sighs> yeah. But anyway, I didn't see Pac much. I had to cut the cake, I had to do this, I had to do this. Big pound, that was something, man. Man, thank you, man. But then I had to, okay, we need to bind the groom in the room. So I had to go do that. So my vision of Pac was that he 
swirl through the dance floor about one good time, got some drinks, dance, take a picture with a couple of my family, and then they swirled right back out. Because they did say, yo, we got a thing to do. Tomorrow we'll go to France. And so, you know, you always had a lot of shit. So, if someone asked me, I would have thought Pac was there about half an hour. Over the next, still today, over the next years, I still discover a family member who I barely know, who lives in bubblefuck anywhere, and they got the most shining, genuine picture of Pac with one of those beautiful love smile. Like, not mugging, he didn't do that in one pic. And I realized he took pictures with everybody, and me and Melissa's family. Okay, yeah, I do want to speak on something. Everything leading up to Sex Packets, musically, that I ever did, every band I was ever in, anything I ever liked, all went into that album. I got a book that's about, with two-thirds finished. Everything from junior high school to ever art, uh, stories, music stories, anything I've observed, a lot of stuff after this learning out, a lot of stuff from lately, a lot of stuff from way back before the view. But anything I've witnessed that I think is interesting or funny is going in this book. It's a almanac of DU, the other things that have nothing to do with music, just things I witnessed and everybody gets their, t their speak in it. For instance, Chuck D gave us a blessed four page, four or five pages. And talked to our editor from midnight to four in the morning. Um, George Clinton gives a nice one. Um, Queen Latifah agreed to do one. And is, we're going to try and talk to some young artists as well, just just to get their opinion on things and then ask them, like, what would you say is the most important? responsibility of a musician or what was your favorite moment working with us? What made you like this one? Why did you pick us to tour with you? Stuff like that. Chuck D, we used to fuck his head up. Because everybody's on tour and Public Enemy would come on and me, Pac, and Mum would drop whatever we were doing and go, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, till we were in the middle, front and center. And we would be like, ah, I got a letter from the government the other day, nigga. They said it out some soccer. We, we rhyming to each other. We rhyming and chucking them. And we not look at them like that's our friend who we're on tour with. We're looking at how we knew Public Enemy before we met Public Enemy. It's like, shh, that's Chuck D. Flavor Flavor, we knew all his parts. Sometimes, the first time they saw us, they were like, you know, he's doing his thing. And then he had this strange look on his face and wouldn't look no more. Then the next city, they you know, caught him off guard. He saw us again. <laughs> After about a week into the tour, he realized we're not bullshitting. We're not there trying to get your attention. We were there because we can be, and that's the best seat in the house to see Public Enemy was right in the front. And after a while, they just uh, forgot about us because we were there every night. We always went out there. It was like a ritual. It was a ritual, boy. <laughs> but yeah, look for that. I don't know what the title is going to be. It's not, a, it's not a very clean book. Y'all know I've went through a lot of periods with sometimes my spiritual low and I fell into addictions and so that stuff's in it too. Then this art put up from years that I was feeling great and those stories are different. Those experiences and the drawings are different. And of course you know I'm a perv so it's gonna be some funny stuff. And you got anything to say to Canada? Hmm. Love you. That's all it's about. <laughs> It's just another place in the world to me, man. I don't, I don't drive for the West and the East. And Canada, it's, I never did. I consider myself a peace warrior. 
And being a true peace warrior is avoiding battle whenever possible. Avoiding war. Yeah, I just don't know, man. And you got any shouts? Shouts? <laughs> There's no one I could say that's more important than anyone else. So I got a lot of friends, a lot of people. I love you all, you know. There's people out there I haven't met yet that I love. All the artists that are out, out all dope. Amazing stuff going on. But, um, yeah. You know, I, this is what I want to shout for. All the musicians who kept doing their thing, even though you knew you were better than some of those people on the radio, and even though that never panned out, and come home from work and still go into their bedroom and make their music, even for themselves. I know a lot of people. And still come home from work, a different job, and then go to their, their play, you know, music gig at the Holiday Inn or the Jazz Club. Or, I know a lot of people do that. Because when you do music, you don't do it for the other stuff. That's why people say like, oh man, uh, what happened? What happened with this one? People used to say that to me. Because, you know, I'm the type of person, I walk down the street barefoot because I was leaving this girl house. And people like, oh, I saw Shock G sitting in the bus bench looking dusty. You know, because I was waiting for the bus. Didn't feel like waiting for so-and-so to come home with my, who had them shoes in her car or whatever. You all right? You, don't need, you sure you don't need a ride? You know, I'm all right, I'm just walking. It's funny in my shoes sometimes. But I want to say to all those artists, it's dope. If you really love music, if you really love painting, if you really love crafting things, writing, if you really love basketball, not being in the NBA is not going to stop you from doing it. And yeah, same thing with that music, you know. Videos and record deals, all that stuff is gravy. The real blessing, and any musician will tell you this, any artist will tell you, is being able to support yourself and your family, pay your rent, and do what you love. That's an extreme blessing. It doesn't feel much different than when you're doing it with your friends at school. If you really love music, it always feels good to make something hot. It doesn't matter if it sells a million, if nobody heard it but you and your family, it's still, you still got to play and go like, ah, oh, that's clean, you know? So, what happened in Digital Underground? Well, we went to different groups, for one. Uh, we continued to tour, had fun, you know, ch changed up. We clicked every now and then and did different records. Just didn't do records for a while just to go on tour with Merce as his DJ. Merce asked me to be his, his music conductor. I can DJ, whatever, or I can do it from the drum machine and the keyboards if I want. So I let me dissect about three of them. Two or three I played over the records. And then the other half of the show, a good seven records, I would just play them for them and just keep my hoodie up. Most people had no clue. You know, I'd drop the hoodie and come out and do risky business with them at the end. Yo, I knew that was Shock G, but I wasn't sure. I would see people saying that to their friend. Because they're not expecting it. And then he's like, I had the place to myself. And some people still didn't know. My parents were out of town. Boom, boom, boom. I'm putting the records down. He walked in and said, Yo, what's the deal, Mars first team, bro? That was a fun thing to see everybody go, ah! Every three or four shows though, it was a lot of shows, somebody would yell out from the audience, Shock J! I would always just keep doing what I was doing, ignore him. Look at Merce. You know, just do what keep doing what I'm doing. Hey, Shock! We would just ignore him. And then they would stop. That would happen once in a blue. Or a heckler, just the whole show. You can't fool me, man. I know that's you. <laughs> it's not I'm trying to fool you. It's his show. I'm just playing the music. <laughs> it's not time for that, <laughs> you know. But it was funny to come out and then 
Those people, the hapless, when they... Yeah. They do this. They don't do that to digital shows. They, that's, you know, Living Legends, Merce and Scarab, they get them heads. Like they do with De La Show. Lyricists get that. But everything's a trade-off. You know, with, we were jealous that they had people that listened to them and because sometimes at our shows, people go, ah, they're dancing, but they're talking, and, ah, you know, doing different things, and just partying, but they're not really listening to us. We say something in between, they don't hear it. So, you got listeners. Do you know what Merce told me halfway through the shows? He said, halfway through, he said, how do y'all get all those girls at y'all shows? You got to talk to them. That's all. You don't like them kind of songs. You gotta let them know you want them to be at the show. And he was like, Yeah. And Murs, he's got an ill look in his eye. Sometimes when he's looking at a girl like at this thing in the hotel room just like this, he looks like you're not sure if he wants to have sex with you. Dice you and bury you in his house. Like, he just look crazy sometimes. Now, I, I said, Morris, I said, whoa, yo. I said, man, that look you just gave me, that's why them girls left last night. Man, loosen up. You look at her like she, look at her like, you know. It was like, oh, oh, wow. It just, I can't, never thought about that this whole life. There was. He did look kind of crazy in his eyes, so he started loosening up and being, a, you know, a friendly guy. He was always friendly, always happy, always strong, always everything. He just looked at girls with this kind of, I guess he got turned down enough times that he was just like, I know this one ain't going to So where y'all going after this? It kind of, the way it had this thing to me is that. You're tired of girls saying no. I, I was the same way. Like, I don't even talk to the hot ones. Because I was like, I know she's not talking to me. I just had no confidence. I would be okay with a girl I almost liked. But the one I really liked, I tongue tied. I couldn't talk to her. It meant too much. Too much riding on it. Come to find out, a lot of those really pretty girls, nobody talks to them. They love it if you just go up and talk to them. They like any guy that has the confidence to do that. Because so many people look at him and like, I know she ain't in my league. But there's no such thing as a league. You know? There's someone looking for everybody out there. So, that's how Risky Business came about. Because he specifically said, he said, I want to do something to get some girls coming to the show. Something like, uh, no, he said, I want to do something like Freaks of the Industry. Something in that vein. My girl loves that. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> she liked the part when you say, and he's, I could see him looking at me like, he has this thing where he's noticing or realizing that there is something to that. It's like all of a sudden, too short, I don't know, AMG, too loud crew, everybody who rhymes girl stuff weren't so much of just, you know, pop sellout, so it wasn't nearly the system, wasn't sexed out as he thought. He was realizing that's part of it. He's a blue collar rapper. At least he was. Murders Moves the World. He talks about relationships really intelligently. Does that stuff. But rarely did he just say, let's get it cracking, where y'all at? And that's why it sounded like Freaks of the Industry. He asked for that vibe. <laughs> Some of the chords. Fun time, man. Fun time. Hey, peace. Uh, all that stuff. Thought you had to. I thought you had to leave by one. <laughs> Yo, and shouts to Shock G Murray. and all day. Thank you so much for the Karis One interview. It means so much for me. You know, building history in Canada, doing it proper. You're the man, that's all I can say. You know what I'm <laughs> Thank saying? You. Mom, I'm not si sick, I'm sick.
I know what you think. <laughs> she like, you didn't look right. You look skin. You look thin. You, your skin look like you're drinking a lot. That's because I'm drinking a lot. I try to get through these shows while I'm sick and not cancel. Because it's just sometimes it's either just I'm going to stay in a room with blankets and take some kind of medicine and, or I'm going to go in the other direction and not be all sad about it. Like, uh, so let's go. Tequila Sunrock. The show was incredible. The keyboards, how you played everything was incredible. Thank you, brother. Just the, the set was just different than what you would have done in Canada. So. It's hard for me to reach my mind right now. It's, like, it's been a really hectic three days. Where, uh, you know, one day, we'll do one like during the day. It won't be before the last thing of the day. And my, when my mind's crisp and the answers are just quick one sentences. I know you'd like to do something like that. It's all good. I really enjoyed everything we did. We made some real history here. Glad you were able to hook up with Devin the dude. Um, Devin's a blessing to the earth, man. Definitely. He's a good cat. That Karis one interview was just amazing, amazing, amazing. Anybody from that generation needs to see that. I'm surprised it's not flurrying and around more with people our age because I sent it to everybody I know who liked hip hop in the 80s. Because what he's telling, he's telling the story of the music. The story of the art form, I mean. You'd be surprised how much he was involved with New York. At least like a quarter of everything going on. You know, it was either him, Russell, Russell Simmons, Rick Rubin, or, but he was one of them leading the art form, leading the movement. So him sitting and telling his life story Every little thing is like, wow, that's how that happened. Whoa, that's how that record was made. That's why LL happened not to be on Stop the Violence. And yeah, everything he said was, wow. Wasn't that crazy? Yes. Oh, are you, I'm not talking for the interview anymore. I'm just talking. <laughs> but, yo, his social worker was Scott LaRock? That blew my mind. No wonder. When I spoke to him about you, it was just like... That was it. You you get whatever you want. You get to do whatever you want. You, you know my best friend. You know what I'm saying? That's how he was? Yep. Wow. I'm getting a little lump in my throat. And? Give you a topic. <laughs> Hip-hop in the golden era. Discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that shit? No, but, wow. Karis one is such a superhero. He's such a protector of hip-hop. He's had so much to do with it. Maintaining the course of it, and he wrote the hip hop Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yup. Hip hop. Temple of hip hop. Oh, and he wrote the Bible. And this is the archivist, and you already know the name, y'all. Yup. It's me, man. Rakatelic. <laughs> Shah G. I'm supposed to be. What up, Big Shah? Oh, you want, man? <laughs>